come to the altar and pray, uh, you're welcome to come. And uh, just a couple quick uh, prayer requests that were mentioned to me. I got a text from Kelly Coulter. The three youngest kids, uh, there's uh, Kane, Kenzie, and Case, uh, are all sick, have ear infections. And then uh, also uh, continue to pray for Vicki um, Houston, she, her shoulder. She's still recovering from her shoulder surgery. Just continue to be in prayer for those that have been uh, sick, still, still cold and flu, still going around a little bit. Let's be in prayer for all those. Uh, be in prayer for Dave DeMoss's mom had surgery, I believe, it was, was it Monday? Or, or she, she's having it on the 8th. Okay, and so be in prayer for, for her. And then uh, just with that. And then pray for Dan Lennon, just still, still dealing with uh, things with, with uh, heart and all the things going on there. And so just all these requests. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer for them. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We pray, Lord, you just be with these requests that we mentioned. Lord, I come to you, Lord, asking that you would just have your, your healing touch, Lord, upon those that are sick. Lord, that you would just uh, be with those that have uh, this just uh, financial hardships. Lord, you'd be with those those that have family difficulties. Lord, some would have children that are uh, just not living for you. Lord, others who uh, have burdens for their, their parents and grandparents who are lost. Lord, just a lot of different needs and burdens on our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd be with each of these. Lord, I pray for the... Uh, 
not only for the, the request that we've mentioned, Lord, I pray also for our service today that you just bless that. Thank you for the good Sunday school hour we've had already. And, Lord, we look forward to a great time here for the 11 o'clock service. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to uh, work uh, on our hearts, Lord. I pray that through the singing you just stir our hearts, challenge us, Lord. I pray that through the preaching we'd be drawn closer to you, Lord. If there's anything that we need to do, Lord, to be right with you, Lord, that you would just uh, convict us of it show us, Lord, what, what needs to be done. Lord, if there's anyone who's lost today, I pray that they would be saved. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Choir members will be getting ready uh, over here for the choir. And uh, just again, I want to welcome you out this morning. And uh, we have, uh, if you didn't get a bulletin, make sure you do so. I'll go over some of those specific announcements here in just a minute. But we're going to get right into the choir, sing a few songs. Trust will be a blessing to you.
Amen. Amen. Praise God for the cross. Let's sing about it. Number 95, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. We'll stand together. We'll sing that first verse, and then we'll shake hands with one another. Number 95, at the cross. Ephesians chapter five or chapter six rather. Ephesians chapter six. Thank you, Brother Jacob. Appreciate you leading there. Thank you, folks, on the with the music. Ephesians chapter six. And we're going to uh, we'll sum up a little bit from chapter five and go into chapter six. When you found it, say amen. Good, four of us. Amen. Good. We're good to go. Ephesians chapter six. And let's just, do, let's just have a word of prayer right away here, and then we'll get right into the passage. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again for your goodness to us. Bless now as we look at your word. I pray you bless Brother Brad and the folks downstairs as they uh, do the uh, junior church. We use Miss Melanie and Miss Sarah as they uh, teach in the, the, the three, four, and five-year-olds. Just bless their time. Lord, just speak to the hearts of those young people. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked here in chapter 5 last week. I'll be honest, I'd hope to get through further, more than what we did, but that's all right. Uh, we looked in chapter 5 from basically from verse 21 down through 33, and it dealt with uh, it, it all still in the context of walking worthy of the vocation where we're called, all dealing with the, staying in the context of being followers as dear children uh, of the Lord. Uh, we, we are looking at different ways, those practical, the, the doctrinal practices that we are to have as Christians. And it dealt with uh, husbands and wives in particular in the home. And then going into chapter 6, we're going to see here about children. We're going to see how fathers with children and things like that, servants with masters. Uh, but just as a quick review, uh, we saw here in, in chapter 5, verse 22, where the command to the wives was to submit themselves unto their own husbands as unto the Lord. And then we saw that the command to the husband, in verse 23, the husband is, uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. And then, uh, I'm sorry, verse 25, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We talked about really. I, jo- I jokingly said God mentioned the uh, the husbands twice as many times as the ladies because we're hard headed and it takes a while to get through. And all the ladies said, "Amen." There you go. And uh, I jokingly said that, but but honestly, I'll say this: God, what God does is He puts the He puts an emphasis on men. It starts with us. We are to be the leaders of the home. We are to be. Uh, it says that we are to love our wives as. Christ of the church. We are there to really represent Christ. Our, the way that we treat our wives, the way that we treat our home, is how Christ treats the church and how Christ, with that self-sacrificing love. And the emphasis, first of all, for us men is we need to be the kind of husband that God wants us to be. Now, 
When, and all the men should say, Amen. When we as men do our part and are the leaders and the husbands that we ought to be, it should be easy for, it, for the wife to say, you know what? I'm, I will gladly submit and I will reverence, as it says in the last part of chapter 5, I will reverence my husband because he is leading me in a way that I know is right. He is leading us in, in a way that will not be harmful to us. He is leading us in a way that would be pleasing to God, just as Christ is leading the church. That's the example. He says, as you, as you Ephesians are living for God, as you Ephesians and as we Christians are being followers of Christ, as we are walking worthy, our homes ought to be a picture. The relationship between husband and wife ought to be a picture to the world of the relationship of Christ with the church. Now, and so just as a quick reminder, husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit yourself. Now, just in case you, you, you say, well, does that mean the wives don't have to love them? No, in first or second Timothy, no, Titus, I'm sorry, Titus, the aged women are told, are, one of the things that they're taught, they are told to teach the younger women is to love their husbands. And so, ladies, love your husbands too. All right? We, we, we need it. We like it. And uh, I promise you, if you love your husband and you are kind to him, he'll, he'll, he might even take you out to dinner one time or something. I don't know. Uh, don't be like, husbands, don't be like the, the old joke where uh, the man, after, after 50 years, his wife says to him, all these years, you've never told me you love me. And he says, well, yes, I did. She says, when? She said, on our wedding day, I told you I loved you. And nothing's changed since. So I, if anything does, I'll let you know. You know uh, but uh, don't be like that kind of a husband. Love your wives. Let them know you love them. And wives, be in submission. Let's say, we talked also about the thought of what happens if you have a spouse who's not, uh, who isn't living as they ought to, who isn't living in a way as a, the pattern of Christ in the church. You pray for them. You still love them. You still, you, you be the right kind of wife. You be the right kind of husband. You do all that you can for them. You, you do what's necessary as according to what God would have you to do. And so through our conversation, it says, uh, which would be our, our behavior, the biblical word conversation is our behavior. Through that, they, will, they may very well see and come to Christ and come to obedience to Christ as a result of our lifestyle. And so we may make sure that we do that. Then we come to chapter 6 here. And I think what I'm hoping to do here is, is get through the first several verses quickly and then just sort of set the stage for, uh, with a little bit for next week. But chapter 6 starts off with, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. For with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Now, we see in this, the end of chapter 5 dealt specifically as uh, with husbands and wives. In this broad generalization of Christians, who's dealt specifically with husbands and wives, chapter 6 starts off with children. Now, we do have some young people in here still. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey your parents. Jacob, obey your parents. Stephen, obey your parents. Uh, let's see here. Who else? We, John, obey your parents. Uh, yeah, Todd, Todd's pointing out Abby back there. But make sure Abby... <clears throat> Do I have to go through every, 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 every person? Yeah. Let's see here. Abby... And uh, our, yeah, Abby and, and Carrie and, and Abby and let's see here who else uh, and we got uh, Cheyenne and Jenny Lynn and Rachel and we got Austin and we got uh, Annabelle Any, anybody else uh, obey your parents obey your, oh uh, Carol, Caroline <coughs> Caroline hey man Caroline obey your parents in the Lord for this is by stand and obey your parents now <laughs> let me find my passage man I got carried away there. Now, listen, we ought to, you young people, obey your parents. Parents, grandparents, adults. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So what are we as parents supposed to be doing? Teaching them what you, that which is right in the Lord. So for you all, Abby, go ahead and point at your dad real quick. Go ahead and point at your dad. Todd, we're talking to you. Uh, in order for children to obey their parents in the Lord, parents, we must teach our children. Grandparents, help teach 
your grandchildren that which is right. We, you look at society today, and we have a generation of people that, of young people that do not obey, I mean, let alone get into verse 2, honor thy father and thy mother. They don't obey, they don't honor. And much, much of that is because they were never taught what was right. They were never taught to obey. We have homes where the children run the homes. If you don't believe it, go to the store, stand in the, in the toy aisle for a while, and eventually you will see, or the candy aisle, and eventually you will see a parent with a child come through, and that child will say, well, I want that. And the parent will say, well, no, you can't have that. And the child will begin to throw a fit and scream and fuss. And then the parent finally just says, okay, well, you can have it. Just, just be quiet. Now, how many of you have ever seen it before? Now, who ran that situation? The kid. The kid. Man, I tell you what, I wish my dad would. Well, as an adult, as a grown adult, I'm glad my dad didn't let me do that. But as a kid, man, I would have loved for my dad to do that. If I tried that, it was not a pretty sight when we got home. <laughs> Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. For us parents, grandparents, adults, let's do our part to make sure they know what is right. Let's do our part to train them and to teach them. Now, it's going to go into that with us a little bit further. But verse 2, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Of course, part of the Ten Commandments, the commandment number five was to honor the father and mother. And when it talks about that, it's that first commandment with promise. God promised back then to, to the Israelites, and, and the promise carries through, that if we honor our parents, that it will be well with us, that we shall live long on the earth. Verse 4 tells us this then. And let me just say this, the difference between obedience and honor. Obedience is, if you want to say the action, honor would be the attitude behind it. Action versus attitude. I can tell Caroline, one of her, her jobs at the house is to, she empties the dishwasher every day. And uh, if her mom says, all right, Caroline, you need to go empty the dishwasher, she can go and she can say, yes, ma'am, I'll be glad to do that, and go in and with a good attitude, she can empty the dishwasher. Or she can say, fine. I can't believe I got to empty the dishwasher. She can empty the whole thing with a bad attitude. She obeyed, but did she honor? No. So uh, the, yeah, it's a it's a twofold thing: obedience, where they carry out in action what was told, but also honor, where they have the right attitude about it. Make sense? And so, young people, again, obey and honor. All right. Now, verse four says, "And ye fathers." Now, again, God has set the husband as the head of the head of the house. Uh, therefore, we ought to, men, we, let's, take, let's take responsibility. Let's stand for what God wants us to do. It's not just something that he haphazardly said. He, he puts a burden, a duty upon us, a responsibility upon us. And in regards to our children, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, here's the thought that, here, provoke not your children to wrath. It's not to say that if you do what's right and your kids get angry that you're at fault. How many parents have ever had to make a decision that your kids got angry about? Raise your hand. So you look around. You're not alone. You're not alone. You make the right decision, and your kids say, ah, oh, it's just not fair. And then we remind them, obey your parents, honor your father and mother. But the thought of provoking is that thought of where really what happens is through inconsistency, through immaturity of the father, they, they don't consistently teach and live by the Word of God. They, they live in a way and they deal with their kids in a way that, is, that brings confusion and strife and to the point where the kids just get so angry and so frustrated they provoke their children to wrath. For example, um, I've seen, I, I know I've seen fathers who do this. They, one minute, they could, they could hardly care less what their kids are doing. I mean, their kids will be doing whatever, and they hardly say anything to them, they don't correct them, whatever, and so it just goes on. Well, then, after a while, dad decides, you know what, I've decided I'm going to do something. And so they do something that they've been consistently allowed to for hours, or days, or weeks, and then they do it again, and all of a sudden, dad snaps at them. What are you doing doing that kind of thing? Don't you know you shouldn't do that? Well, here's the problem. They don't know because dad has, in allowing them to do it, to do something, has basically taught them this is okay. 
And now he snaps at him. Now, what does that do to a child? Whoa, I, what, 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 what can I do? What can't I do? Or a parent who is consistently, uh, who, who is regularly hard on a child and then, and then lets things go, and then is hard again, and then lets things go. You know, that, that's just going to frustrate. It, it frustrates any of us, let alone our kids. We, we, I think we all understand, this, and, 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 the, and society even knows this through, through uh, research and all this stuff. Kids, whether they want to admit it or not, kids need and like structure. They want somebody to say, here's what you can do, here's what you cannot do. They want somebody to show love to them and give them boundaries and, and things like that, even, even discipline. They want this. You know, think about all the people that have been, that have been interviewed that they get arrested as a, as a young adult and they say, well, I just never really knew what was right or wrong. I just wish my, my parents would have told me. I know adults today who are young adults who are frustrated because they have no idea how to even really live life because their parents never taught them and were so inconsistent. And, and now they just think, what do I do? How do I, how do I function? I mean, I don't, you know, it, it breaks my heart how many young people go into a job. You know, I think back in a generation previous to mine and the generations ahead, uh, ahead of those where people would walk in, men, young men would come in at 17, 18, 19 years old, would, would walk in, get a job, and would, live, and would work at that job for 20, 30, 40 years. Consistent. Knew, knew what to do. They, 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 whether it was easy, whether it was hard, they did it. They just went in and, and worked that job. Today, the young people walk in and, and they just want to collect a paycheck. They don't want to work. Now, they, they'll work if it's something that's nice for them, but um, there, there's, there's a young man, I, I, uh, none of you would know, but I've been helping, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago at, uh, that uh, Melanie, who's the Pizza Joe's uh, manager in town, she uh, had to, uh, unfortunately, fire several people. And she was a little low, and so Brother Brad and I have been helping her out with some delivery, a couple of delivery shifts a week. There's a young man there who, uh, he's about 16 years old. He's 16, just got his driver's license. And he, last week, he was doing a job out front where he was, he doesn't deliver anything, but he was working out front, and he was working the cash register, and he said, he said, yeah, he just got a new car, well, new to him, new car, and, and just got his license a week or so ago. And he said, I'm hoping to get some tips that people leave every once in a while, for, you know, even at the, the register. I'm hoping to get some tips so that way I can, I can uh, be able to put some things aside. I want to get my car fixed up and this and that. So that's great. Well, last night, I was there for a few hours delivering. And there's Tristan doing what is probably the nastiest job in the place. He had to clean the grease out of some of the pans. And he had to put the new grease. By the way, if you don't like grease, don't go to pizza places because, man, it's they survive on that stuff, but he's, I mean, and he's, I mean, it's grease everywhere all from, he's wearing, I think he even had gloves on, but it's up to here, and, and I came through, and I'm, I'm just making deliveries, and for two and a half hours, I'm doing deliveries, and he was at that table cleaning those nasty pans for two hours. I finally came through, and I said, man, that's a nasty job, isn't it? He goes, yeah, but, oh well, and I thought, praise the Lord for a young man who's at least got some character. Who doesn't say, oh, I don't want that job. I just want to be out there getting tips. But you know what? Unfortunately, it seems that these days, I, I hope it's not the case, but it almost seems that that's the exception to the rule. The exception to the rule. We have people, young people, and, and say, what, what, what are you talking about, preacher? It all comes back to parents. Parents who raise their children and train their children to be good adults, to be uh, good Christians, to be profitable to society, to be productive in society. It says, fathers, provoke not your children under wrath, uh, to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So you had a twofold uh, command here. The first part is on the negative side. Don't live in such a way that you're, with your inconsistency and, 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 and your, whether it be inconsistency of life or inconsistency of, 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 of speech, don't live in such a way that you're going to provoke your children to wrath, but they're so confused and they're so frustrated, they just get so upset about it. it says, but instead of that, rather, the, the alternative is this, the positive side, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, I think, I hope all of us understand this. That does not just mean that we read the Bible to them. 
That means that we train them in the way that they should go. That it's an over it's an overall process. You know, th- does the Bible teach that that we ought to be have a good work ethic? Does the Bible teach that we ought to have a good work ethic? Yeah. So, fathers, parents, train your children to have a good work ethic. Does the Bible teach us that we ought to be honest? Absolutely. So, parents, train your children to be honest. Does the you get the idea? It's not just okay. Well, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, I read the Bible to them and I brought them to church. It's now. That's very important. I'm not putting that aside. I'm saying, but all of this together. Raise your children, bring them up, train them in the way that God wants them to be. So they grow up to be a faithful, obedient, God-honoring, God-pleasing Christian adult. All these things that we've been reading about in chapter 4, chapter 5, now in chapter 6, all these things that we as Christians ought to be doing, bring your children up, to abide by these guidelines. Make sure that they understand. Make sure that they see. They're having a good time down there. That's okay. They're they're doing some kind of, I don't know, either either Brother Brad's teaching them a song or or a mouse just ran across the floor. I don't know. Either way, they'll be fine. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which tells us, physically speaking, bring them up to be productive, profitable adults. Spiritually speaking, profitable, productive adults who are God-fearing, God-pleasing, God-honoring in their actions and their attitudes. Bring them up the right way. Listen, we need need to continue generation after generation after generation of good, godly people. That's what we need in our our nation and in this world. We've already talked about the fact, and he's going to touch again on it, in fact, just a minute here about the spiritual warfare. We've talked about the fact that redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. We need to bring up our young people to understand and to realize that they have to carry on the same walk for Christ as we are trying to do. Because, the, because generation after generation after generation in our society is getting worse and worse and worse. And we need young people who are not just told, well, you ought to go to church, you ought to read your Bible, and that's it. But who are trained, who are brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now it goes on to talk about servants and masters. Verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of, heart, of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, we we can in those days they had people literally who were bond servants. They they whether they uh, sold themselves to service for for uh, to get out of a debt or maybe to be able to have something for their family. Uh, some people were just literally were slaves in that culture. Today it might be we relate it more to employee and employer. Uh, but he says when when we are servants, it says be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Now think about this. <clears throat> There were well, we have we have a we have a biblical example of Philemon and Onesimus. In the book of Philemon, Onesimus was a slave who had run away from Philemon. Paul met him. Onesimus gets saved, and Paul sends him back to Philemon with the letter with the book of Philemon, saying, in essence, take him back. He's a brother in Christ. Anything that he that he's cost you or that he owes you, put it on my account. I'll pay for it. And it's a great picture of what Christ did for us. But the thought was this: that you had two. Christians, Christian brothers in Christ, brothers in Christ, but one was a master and one was a servant. Now, in this whole thing here, remember back in chapter 5, verse 21, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, they as Christians were to submit one to another. But he's also still reminding those that are servants, listen, just because you are a Christian and maybe your master is a, is a brother in Christ or maybe your master is lost, you don't have, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you are better than them, that you now are able to step out of your role as a servant. He says, rather, you need to serve in such a way as you would serve as if Christ were your master. With a good attitude, with the right spirit, giving an honest day's labor, doing all those things that are right. Now, you say, well, listen, I, I can see two, two, two aspects where in our flesh we might get upset about some things. In our flesh, we might say, 
if he was a Christian? Well, he's a Christian brother like I am. We're both saved by grace. What's the, I, I don't see why he should still be my... If he was a good Christian, he'd let me out of this. Now, in our flesh, can you see yourself maybe saying that? But yet he says, you're there for a purpose. You're there for a reason. Serve as though you're serving Christ. On the other hand, well, here I am. I'm a child of God. And this guy, he's not even saved. I'm supposed to serve some heathen? Absolutely. With the right attitude. You, you serve him in a way that as though you were serving God. Why? Because with the right attitude, with the right spirit, you might bring them to God. Again, goes, going back there. Uh, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. In essence, listen, this is the place that God has put me. I'm going to serve, I'm going to work just as though I'm walking in and my boss is Christ himself. Now, if that were the case, I think we would all, I'm not, I'm not saying that we're dishonest or anything, but I think we would all specifically make sure, man, I'm going to make sure that I'm doing what's right. I mean, I normally do, but, but I'm going to absolutely make sure that I don't, that I don't mess something up today. I don't, I'm going to absolutely make sure I do things right by the book. Because that's Christ right there. Fear and trembling, singleness of heart goes on to say in verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the service of servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Now, you know what? You know, with eye service as men pleasers, that means, oh, wait, oh man, the boss is looking. Let me make sure I look good. Now, I know none of you do that, but how many of you have ever seen people who do that? Yeah, we know what you're talking about. Oh, wait, the boss is looking. But as soon as the boss goes, uh, pull around, goof off. We've all met people that way. It says, if you're a Christian, man, that's the last thing you ought to be doing. If you're a Christian, whether somebody's looking at you or not, you need to be working faithfully. You need to be working obediently. You need to be doing the will of God from the heart. It goes on to say in verse 7, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Again, we're not there to please men. We're there to please God. And may I say this? If we please God, men will be pleased unless they are anti-God. But most people, when I was in Bible college, I worked at, at, the, at a restaurant. My wife eventually worked there. My sister worked there. Probably about six or seven other people from our Bible college worked at this same restaurant uh, for the year and a half, two years roughly that we were there. And at one point, my boss told me, he said, listen, Jeremy, if you know if, if there's anybody at that Bible college that you want to recommend to come get a job, he said, I will hire them. I will hire them, he said, because everybody that we've had from that college has come. They come, they work hard, they, they work from from." the time they're supposed to start all the way to the time that they are to go home. They said they're obedient, they're honest, they have a good attitude. They said, anybody that you can recommend from that college, we'll take them. Now, what was it? All it was was we were just doing what God wanted us to do, and he, who was not even a saved man, saw the fact that, hey, they're honest, they're, they're right. That's the kind of people we want because that pleases us. And that's what God's saying here. That's what Paul, under the inspiration of God, is saying, that we do this, uh, that... Not, 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 as, uh, not with eye service as men's pleasers, but as a service of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with goodwill, doing service as the Lord and not to men. And men will be pleased if we live and work the way God wants us to work. Verse 8, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. God will bless you for doing what you're supposed to do. Verse 9, he says, And you masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, Knowing, uh, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Now, he masters, he says, you're a master, you're saved. Make sure that you still, in regards to your servants, you treat them the way that you would treat Christ. You treat them in a way that is pleasing to God. He says, forbearing, threatening. Forbearing means that even if you have a right to do something, you just say, I choose not to. It says, even if you... Now, think about this. In, in that culture, think about cultures that have slaves. And we hear about... We, we've all read about whether it be the abuse or just the, the, the uh, strenuous influence that was put upon those in servitude. Threatenings was something that just came with the job, if you want to say it that way, as a master to a slave. But he says, forbearing threatening. Even though you might have a right to threaten and to try to cause harm to this person, just put it aside. Treat them the right way. Treat them the way that you ought to. Treat them the way that would please God. 
And so as Christians, if we're a servant, if we're a master, he gives us ideas on how we have to live. Now, having said all that, we come to verse 10. And honestly, last week I had hoped to get through the husbands, wives, and children and masters, but obviously we didn't. Verse 10 then comes with this. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Next week we're going to pick up verse 14 and go through the end. But I want to take just a few minutes and just focus here on verse 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, he's getting ready to close out this letter. He's given them all those doctrinal truths in the first three chapters of of salvation, of, of, of uh, sanctification, of, of uh, predestination, all those different things. He's, he's given them the doctrinal truths of the church and how Gentiles and, and uh, Christ, uh, Jews are all the same in Christ. He goes on and gives the doctrinal practices of chapter three, chapter, or chapter 4, chapter 5, into chapter 6. And now he says, finally, brethren, with all these things in mind, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His mind. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you again the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. He says, now we've gone through all these different things, chapters 1 through all the way into chapter 6. He says, with what you know, with what you've been taught, with all the things that I've given to you, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Why? Because, he tells us, the devil wants to get us. He talks about the wiles of the devil. Because there is a spiritual warfare going on. We don't, we don't fight against, we shouldn't fight against each other. We don't fight even against, listen, think, think about this just, if you want to say politically or, or just with warfare in our, in our world right now, we're not really fighting against Islam and their terrorist attacks as far as us versus Arabs, if you say it that way. What we are, what's going on is spiritual warfare in the form of Islamic attacks on freedom. And we know that that was going to come all the way from back in, in, in the book of Genesis when you had... Isaac and Ishmael, when you had Jacob and Esau, those tribes from, from those people, from Esau and from Ishmael, were our, Ishmael's descendants were going to be warlike and always in battle and always causing trouble. That's, that's who the Arabs are. But it's still based on spiritual warfare. All the battles for Jerusalem and for Israel, it's all spiritual. It's all spiritual. It's all based on where Christ, God has said, this is my people, this is their land, and this is where I will set up my throne when the millennium comes. And they don't want that. And this spiritual warfare, yes, it comes in the face of Arab versus Jew, but it's all part of spiritual, we have to understand spiritual warfare. Listen, if I get upset with Rocky Harmon and he gets upset with me, it's not because, it, it, it shouldn't be me against Rocky or Rocky against me. If we are, if we're at odds, you know why? Because of the spiritual warfare that's wanting to get two Christians at odds with each other. It's the devil saying, you know, maybe I can get these two to start fighting. And if these two start fighting, then it's going to cause repercussions all over the place. My enemy would not is not Rocky Harmon. My enemy is the devil. His enemy is not Pastor McLean. His enemy is the devil. But boy, how how often we find ourselves, how often we find ourselves saying, well, that guy. Or that woman, or those people, that's not what it's about. Spiritual warfare. He says, be strong in the Lord. And let me say this two, two different aspects to this thought that I have. Be strong in the Lord. First of all, we can't be strong enough in ourselves to overcome the devil to overcome this spiritual warfare. We just can't do it. We can do it for a while, maybe. We might be able to 
But eventually, listen, the devil, if we, if we go after the devil in our own flesh, in our own might, we are limited. We are limited. I don't know about, if, if think about it in your homes. If there are, if there are days where, where my wife and I, if one of us is maybe just tired, worn out, for me, she'll say, if, I'm, if I haven't eaten soon enough, <laughs> sometimes we can get a little snippy with each other. And you might just see that, that I might, she might say something, or the kids might come around through, and I might just, hey! And, and act in a way that's not normal to what I would do. Or I might say something to my wife that would hurt her, or, or vice versa. Now, is it because I don't love my wife or because she doesn't love me? No, because even in our flesh at times, we just get tired. We might respond in a way that we normally wouldn't respond. You all with me? You know why? Because that's our flesh. That's how we are in our flesh. Be strong, not in your flesh. Be strong in the Lord. We need the Lord's strength in our life. Now, be strong in the Lord. We look at it this way. We say, I'm going to be strong in the things of the Lord. Now, in order to be strong in the things of the Lord, we have to know what the Word of God says. We have to obey and abide by the Word of God. And we strengthen ourselves as Christians. And we can be strong in the Lord with that. But not only that, strong in the Lord in the fact that He is our reliance. That He is who we are depending on to help us through these tasks. I absolutely believe that you can look. There's all kinds of different biblical precedent for this. Where God says, you do as much as you can and then let me take care of the rest. But he's not going to say, well, let me, you just sit there and do nothing and then I'll take care of it. He says, you do what you can do. Think about this. Uh, Moses and the Israelites. They're at the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army behind them. Mountains on both sides. What do we do? And he says, go forward. God tells Moses to have them go forward. And they go forward and God gives them the victory as the sea is parted with the rod in the air. They go forward. They go through. And then God gives victory by wiping out the, the Egyptian army. Think about when they crossed the Jordan River. You know, the water of the Jordan River didn't, didn't start going back until the priest's feet hit the water. They, the priest they says, all right, you're going to follow the priest. You're going to have the, the Ark of the Covenant. Going out, across the river, you're going to go over on dry land. The water is still at flood stage. It wasn't until their foot hit the water that all of a sudden, there it goes. He didn't say, just stand here and, and then I'll take care of it. And, and, no, he says, you do your part and then I will take care. We as Christians do our very best to abide by this. We do our part and then God says, and now as you're doing your part, let me give you that boost that you need. Let me help you. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Let me say this. I think we all agree. It's just common sense. God's might is far greater than our might. Not even, not even comparable. All of us together, we were going to have a, we're going to have a tug of war with God. We're going to get all 118 people that were here today on one side of the rope, and we're going to beat God in this tug of war. Waste of time. Waste of time. He doesn't even have to flex his little pinky, and, and we're all <laughs> drugged through the mud. Waste, his might. Say, well, why do we need to be in the power of His might? Because the next verse tells us, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil wants to get us. He wants to ruin your home. He wants to ruin your marriage. He wants to ruin your kids. He wants to ruin our church. He wants to ruin society. He wants to destroy anything and everything that he can. The preacher, that, I mean, that just sounds a little crazy. You can think so. I just choose to believe the Bible. And the Bible tells us he's trying to destroy all these things. In the, in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how, how God will allow these creatures out of the pits of hell to come and to bring... It. Now, this is during the time when the Antichrist, who is indwelt by the devil himself at that point in time, when he is in charge, he is in control, and he's off trying to kill Jews, he's trying to kill anybody who would take the name of Christ, and under his control, God allows him, the devil, to let, let, unleash these, these beings from the pits of hell that go around and, and, and harm individuals on earth under his rule. Boy, what a great God, huh? He, 
He just wants to harm and destroy and cause trouble. That's all He does. And He wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin your testimony. He wants to ruin your home. He wants to destroy these things. And the only way that we can have victory against Him, the only way that we can withstand Him is in the power of God's might. It's like, now I, didn't have a, I never had a bigger brother. I was the oldest and I had two younger sisters. But my dad, he, he had a brother, his, my Uncle Rick, who was two years older than him. And I can remember my dad talking about the fact, and some of you relate to this. He can remember being about nine, ten years old, being at the playground after school, and there's a kid who kept trying to beat him up. Beat him up two, three, four days in a row. He beat my dad up. Finally, my dad said, you don't leave me alone. I'm going to get my big brother. Well, big brother shows up, my Uncle Rick, and when he gets there, all of a sudden, that bully didn't want to mess with my dad anymore because there's my Uncle Rick, who's at that point about 11, 12 years old. He said, I'm not going to mess with this guy. And there was great comfort in knowing for my dad that he could call his big brother and that his bro- big brother would stand up for him. You know, they had that relationship where I can beat up my little brother, but nobody else can beat him up. You know how that is. And so, when you think of that, think about this. The devil wants to come and beat us up. But we have somebody on our side who's far greater than just a big brother. We have God Almighty. In Romans it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? The Bible tells us, greater is he that is in us, those who are saved, than he that's in the world, the devil. But the only way we can withstand the wiles of the devil, the only way that we can overcome this spiritual warfare as we warfare against that that which is not flesh and blood, but those spiritual things, is in the power of God's might. Wrapping up what we've talked about today, Husbands and wives, how can you have the right kind of home? It has to be in the power of His might. What do you? What can you say, well, preacher? I don't know if I can. I, you, you keep putting this pressure on us husbands to be the head of the home and be like Christ is to the church. How do I do that? In the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Live your life as God would want you to. Pattern your home like the way God would want you to, and in His strength and in His power. God, please help me. Help me to be the husband I can be. Help me to be the father I need to be. Help us to have the right kind of home. We plead and God will give us the power and the strength to do that which is right if we will yield to what He wants us to do. How can I be the right kind of wife? Preacher, you don't know what my husband's like. Preacher, you don't understand. As I said last week, here in the real world, listen, that just means, as I said last week, it means get out of what you call the real world and get into what God's plan is and do it right. But preacher, you just don't understand. God, help me to be the wife I can be. I need to be. God, help me to be submissive to my own husband. Help me to pray for my husband. Help me to be the, the, the help that he needs in his strength, in the power of his might. God, I don't know if I can do this on my own. In his strength. Children, obey your parents. But, but God, I don't know if I can. I mean, I, my parents just don't understand me. They just don't understand me. God, I need your help to be obedient and honoring. Fathers, God, I need your help to be the father that I need to be to bring up my child and nurture and admonition of the Lord. Employees, God, I need your help to be the right kind of employee to serve as though I'm serving you. I can't do this in my own ability. I, listen, we've all worked with people that we just wanted to punch. <laughs> yeah. Lord, I'm supposed to treat this person right. I need your help today. Help me. All the way through. Going all the way back to all these things we're supposed to be doing. Chapter 4. We're supposed to be have lowliness of mind and humility and all those things. But how do we do it? In His strength. In His might. Because if we rely on self, I don't care how patient of a person you are in your flesh, if you rely on self, eventually you're going to find that person who's going to know what button to push and you're going to explode on them. 
in your flesh. How do I do? How do I overcome that? In God's strength, in the power of His might. Why? Because all these things around us, conflict between between people, it's a result of spiritual warfare. Because the devil wants conflict between us. The, the, the battles in our mind of do I obey or do I not obey? That's part of spiritual warfare because he wants us to battle in our mind and decide to obey or disobey God. All of it. Walking circumspectly, redeeming the time, it's all part of spiritual warfare. That the devil says, don't worry about what's in the way. Don't worry about where you're going. Just do whatever you want to do. It's a lie from the devil. Spiritual warfare. The only way we overcome it the only way is by doing it the way God wants us to do it. In His power. In His might. In His strength. The spiritual warfare, though it's a separate passage, as He's finishing up, He's summing up everything. You know when we write letters? I don't know if people write letters anymore. We write, we all send a, a text you know, real fast. When you write letters, you have your introduction, you know, I hope you're doing well. Things are going good here. You have the body of your letter, and then you conclude. And usually at the end, you sum up, you finalize, and bring it back to, to the you, – you sum everything up, of what you've said in the letter, and say, and then here's the final thing I just want to tell you before I say goodbye. That's what he's doing. He's saying, I've taught you all these things about where you stand in Christ. I've taught you all these things of what the church is in Christ. I've taught you how you ought to live in Christ, how you ought to behave uh, in general as well as specifically as husbands and wives and parents and children and servants and masters. He says, with all these things in mind, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might because you can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. Now, let me say this and we'll be done. It sound, I don't want it to sound mystical like, you know, what do I have to do? What's the right formula? And then God descends upon us. What you do is you yield yourself to that book right there. You live according to that book right there and with prayer, asking God to help you. He's there. It's really not that hard. It's not. It, it, it's a simple matter of just obedience and prayer, asking God to help. Think of a father and child relationship. Father and child relationship. My little boy Seth. If he's living in a way that pleases Dad, Dad has no problem helping him do the things that are pleasing. To dad. Does that statement make sense? If I say, listen, here, here, here's what I want you to do to be the right kind of a son. And I see that he's doing those things. And I see that, you know what? Boy, he's, he's having a little difficulty. He's doing the best he can. He's having a little difficulty. I'm going to be right there to help him along, right? But if I say, here's what I want you to do. And this is pleasing to me. And he says, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do my own thing. And then he says, Dad, I'm having a hard time. Will you help me? Am I going to help him? No. But if he's doing what's right and he says, Dad, I'm having a hard time. Can you help me? Am I going to help him? Absolutely. And he will get the job done in the power maybe of Dad's might. Because he's doing what he's supposed to do and Dad wants to help him do those things. Our Father says, live by the book. Do these things that are right. And I'm here to help you. You've got my power. You've got my strength available. Listen, there's, there's warfare going on. The devil's going to do everything he can to stop you from doing it. But I'm here to help you. If you have a difficult time, just call on me. I'm right here. We'll get through it. I'm here to help you every step of the way. The danger comes when we say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to go here. And then we say, why isn't God helping me? But the obvious answer is, why would he help us do something that we're not supposed to do? Instead, what we've done is we've said, I'm going to say, forget it, God. I'm going to go this way. 
And the devil will help us right along and say, yeah, let's keep going down this path of destruction. Let's keep going down this path of, of, of heartache. Let's keep going down this path of sorrow. It's only until we then say, God, I was wrong. Will you help me? That he says, absolutely. Let's get back over here where we ought to be. Next week, we'll look at the armor. But tonight, or today, let's be right, reminded. The battle is real. And the way that we get through it, not by our strength, because we are limited. Not by our might, because it means nothing, really. But it's in the strength, it's being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might that we can overcome in this battle. Heads bowed, eyes closed as we stand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity just to look at Your Word, to share Your Word, to see these truths. Lord, I, I pray that today, wherever we are in this battle, wherever we are in regards to God working to help us, the devil working to hinder us, Lord, I pray that, first of all, we're just surrendered and yielded to You. It might be in our homes. It might be in our, as a husband or wife. It might be as a father or a child or a mother. It might be as a, a, an employee, as an employer. It might be just in our daily walk as we, as we walk obediently according to the, the paths as, as a, a faithful children, as we walk worthy of the vocation where we're called. Lord, in all these areas, in all these places, Lord, I pray that we would see the need to walk in Your strength and in Your might. But Lord, that strength and might is, is available as we do which is right, not as we do which is wrong. Lord, if we're in a place that we're not where we should be, I ask that You would make it clear to us. I ask, Lord, that You'd help us to rely upon You and to call on You with a clean heart, a confessed heart, and say, God, I need Your help to do what I know is right. Lord, it may be that there's someone here today that, that the stage of battle that they're in is they're not even saved. Maybe today the, the, whole, the, 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 the devil is on one side saying, don't get saved. You don't need to be saved. You can do it another time. It'll be just fine. And maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, listen, you're lost. You're bound for hell. You need to trust Christ as Savior. Lord, if there's someone today who's not saved, I pray that even now they would just step out and come and allow us to show them from your word how they can know for sure they're on the way to heaven. Lord, that there be no doubt, there be no worries. Lord, bless this invitation time now in Jesus' name. Amen. As the music begins to play, the altars are open. Some have already come to pray. If you need to come, why don't you come now? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one looking around. Others are moving already. Others come to pray. Whatever it might be, God's the only heart about a matter. Why don't you come? If, certainly, if you're not saved, why don't you just come and, and get my attention to the preacher? I need to be saved. I want to be saved. Allow us to show you from God's Word how to be saved. As the music plays, as others are praying, if you need to come, why don't you come? Others are still coming. Those praying. Got plenty of time.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank You again just for Your goodness to us. Thank You, Lord, for those who come. And Lord, I pray that You just be with those burdens that are on their hearts and their minds. Lord, I pray that You just help them. Lord, in whatever decisions they've come to make, Lord, others, others that have come to pray for family members, for other situations, I pray that You just work on behalf of all of those. Lord, bless us as we go home today. I pray that You just give us a, a good afternoon, a restful afternoon. Bring us back here tonight at 6 o'clock for our evening service. Lord, I pray that You just help us, Lord, to be, be Christians who live for You to live a life that is pleasing to you, nor that we do it all in the, the power of your might, Lord, knowing that you've already given us victory, Lord, that you've already won. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Be here tonight and we'll...